So I guess we'll go ahead and get started. Um, welcome everyone to Book Sandwich Den. This is our second session, uh, fall session. We have two more Wednesdays after this, so I hope they're on your calendar. Um, I would like to introduce today's reviewer, um, Barb Shine, and she has lived in the area for over four years. She received her two-year degree from Genesee Community College before attending Buffalo State College. Later in life, she earned a master's degree in management from Robert Wesleyan College. She has worked in manufacturing, has been an entrepreneur, and before her retirement, was employed at GCC as a business professor. While retired, uh, Bart has been involved in community action of Orleans and Genesee, very involved, um, and is currently the board chair. Barb and her husband purchased and built their home on the old New Lake property in the town of Batavia in 2001. And they found themselves constantly busy attempting to keep up with Mother Nature's impact to everyday life around the lake. Now they've sold that. But <laughs> we said it is. This is all lake breaking news. Yeah. Yes. yeah. In addition to all of these things, Barb is a fellow book club member with me. She is a fellow master gardener, and she's a fellow Mahjong aficionado. Yes. Oh. <laughs> but most importantly, Barb is my friend. And it is with pleasure that I introduce her to review the book. Uh, thanks. Thanks. Um, when I was asked to do this, I guess I have to be honest with you, I wasn't sure how this was all going to go. And so bear with me on my quote-unquote PowerPoint because it really will keep me online and directed. Otherwise, I'd be all over the board to make a long story short. And the book is a lot to make a long story short, too, because there's a lot of information in it. And again, the, the PowerPoint helps me stay on track a little bit. Um, I, I'm going to share with you um, this particular book cover compared to the one that's on the shelf and the one that I read. because I like this because it seems to stand out a little better. And I really like what it says in the bottom because at the end of the day, the outcome of the book, the takeaway, is how two pioneering sisters brought medicine to women and women to medicine. So that is the outcome of the book after you read through it. So it kind of seemed like the right one and it, and it looked a little better show up wise on this particular uh, suit. This is the author, uh, Janice Lumera. I think I'm pronouncing it okay. Uh, She's an interesting lady. In fact, to be honest with you, after I learned a little more about her and read her this book, The Doctors Blackwell, um, I'm going to read her other book. Her first book was called Don, uh, Daughters of Sam Samara, or Samurai. I'm sorry, Samurai out of Japan, 1871. And again, it's built on letters and bunches of research, so it's a biography again. And I think that one's going to be as interesting as this one was to me because we're talking about kiss this one. The government of Japan sends five women to America to be to learn about culture here, and these young girls are to go back and teach men, Japanese men, so that they're more uh, a more enlightened generation. So I thought this was kind of interesting. So I want to read that um, next to make one for short. This is was a good book, and, it, and she really delves into letters that were um, written by the sisters and and. Um, uh, all kinds of research that she's done beyond that. I was really impressed with the back of the book that's got all kinds of um, notations where she got information and pages and pages of that. So obviously it's been well researched to make a long story short. Um, so, and I, I suspect the next book, uh, the book I, I want to read prior to this one is as well. Um, so who were these uh, doctors and where did they come from? So I wanted to share some fun story about that. Um, there were eight children altogether, okay, born to this uh, Samuel and Hannah uh, uh, Blackwell, and uh, Elizabeth and Emily. Elizabeth is the fourth child, and Emily is the six, uh, seventh of eight children. Five female, three male, okay, so big family, eight of them all together, all right? Elizabeth is six years older than Emily, keep this in mind, okay? They are born in England. They weren't born here in the States, by the way, okay? And, and, and um, Elizabeth doesn't get her citizenship until way later during her career. Um, Samuel, the father, was an owner of a sugar processing operation in England. 
Okay, so they were kind of middle class plus. They had wealth, there were some wealth, enough dollars in the system. They kept these people with a governess, two maids, okay, as part of the deal. And when they came to America, they brought the governess, two maids, and a couple of aunts with them. So think about the entourage, if you will, of people, because all eight children were born in England. They were advocates of education, hard work, and obviously self-improvement. They were capitalists, obviously, to owning his own business, if you will. But also what's interesting is they were idealists. And this is what's an old contraire in this book. Keep in mind, you get sugar from sugar beets. Where do you get sugar beets? The Caribbean. So they were bringing their sugar from the Caribbean to be processed in, the, in, in England, but guess what? They were using slaves. And ironically, what's most interesting is these people supported anti-slavery and stood tall, at least by not, they didn't walk the talk, they just talked it is the best way to describe it, okay? So I thought that was kind of interesting. Now, he, they moved to America, this whole family, this whole group moves to America in 1832. And why? <laughs> Apparently in Bristol, in uh, England at that time, there was a lot of violence from a labor standpoint. So they were living in a, a city that was part of that and they were nervous and scared. Samuel's refinery burns down, which apparently happens often in that business, okay? So it went smaller, so there was no less money coming in, so there was loss of investment money going on as well. Samuel thinks that coming to America is the place to go. You know, think about this, in 1832, that they're moving on a ship. Um, they, they end up coming into New York, stay there a while, stay in New Jersey a while, but they end up settling in Ohio, right where, the, where it all starts. Um, he passes away, Samuel, the father, passes away, leaves this family of eight, okay, children-wise, and his wife and the two aunts, as I understand in the book, um, with 20 bucks, $20. That's all he's got left, okay? So, obviously, what's happened now, okay, what do they do? The daughters, particularly, not all of them, but most of the daughters end up teaching. Kind of interesting perspective from an education-wise, okay? They're very bright and obviously read, read, read. That's part of the family uh, story, if you will. Now, it's also kind of interesting to know that none of the five Blackwell daughters ever marry. None of them. The two doctors don't marry either, okay? The two sisters are Emily and um, Elizabeth. They never marry. But you know what they do? They adopt two little girls in their career. After they become doctors, this is kind of a fun story. Um, Elizabeth ends up adopting after, in their, they're into their career now. They've actually made it to be doctors, and we'll have to talk about that in a minute. And um, she adopts this little six-year-old from an orphanage, okay? This is, and, and the little girl ends up calling her Miss Elizabeth to her lifetime. This little girl ends up staying and being a companion to Elizabeth her whole life. Her whole life, she never marries either. Flip side, Emily, who does not uh, marry either, ends up adopting a baby. And Emily's little baby calls her mama. Just kind of think about that, because that really speaks a lot to the personalities of these two sisters who end up doing some pretty, pretty unique things in, this, in the scheme of things. But they never marry. They never marry. All right, so I want to show you. I always get, I apologize here. I'm moving too far one way or the other. I always get entertained with how they looked when they were young, okay? <laughs> so that's why I, I, I went to the internet and I did find all these pictures of Elizabeth. You go on the internet, the story about Elizabeth is much bigger than it is about Emily, the, the younger sister. It just is, and, it, and rightfully so as we talk about this, okay? And so whenever you see Emily now, pretty much this is the stance you'll see of her in the internet most often. Um, and that's apparently the one that everybody kind of kind of knows who she is based on now. All right, Let's see if I can get this the right way now. All right, so now, Elizabeth becomes the first female doctor in America. Important to understand, in America, I did a little digging there were people who were, became doctors in Brazil. The first one I could find was in Brazil, Rio de Janeiro. I mean, what level of expertise they had, I had no clue. Okay, but at any rate, um, they, so says the internet, we all know about that, right? Can't be sure. But at any rate, um, 
this is this is what I found. And uh, in America, Miss Elizabeth Blackwell is acknowledged as the first female doctor, 1849. I want you to think about what was going on in 1849 here in America. Think about women, particularly. What do you think? Not much happened in Brussels. Not, yeah. <laughs> Not much happened. We're pretty. We're supposed to sit pretty. Wear all of the, the things that make us female, if you will. Couldn't be out late with a man, for sure, and never alone. Think about all of that perspectives based on very uh, straight values for we ladies. So kind of want you to think about that. Now, Elizabeth, <clears throat> fourth child in the group of many, okay, um, very solid, very kind of a preferred solitude over socializing. She really wasn't out about, you know, reaching out to people around her. She felt that um, the traditional medical charm of women, I want to quote this, how gay the ladies look, how miserable their waists all pinched up. Like, quote unquote, okay? Um, she was a ferocious, a ferocious leader, uh, a reader rather, um, Elizabeth was. All, always a book in front of her, especially growing up, okay? Very intelligent and very articulate. Very articulate. She journaled continuously through her career. She wrote letters to multiple, multiple people, friends, family, uh, obviously at her uh, professional counterparts when she could. Um, she publishes books and essays, does lectures. So she's a very well-read, bright, brilliant lady. Um, and the author, or the author of our book here, she uses a lot of that those letters and things that she actually wrote about in here. Uh, lots and lots and lots of books. Um, Anti-slavery was a primary form of social engagement back in that time, and these and those sisters went to lots of those events here in the North, okay, here in America. Now this is the fun part. Elizabeth is a very self-confident woman going into this whole story, okay? She's going into it. Who feels her voice is very important, is why my take here and she often feels it's superior to other women. <laughs> okay? So I get that message throughout reading this book, that she thinks she's just smarter than the average bear, for lack of way to say that, <laughs> you know? Other women, so it, it, she's an interesting, interesting lady, but I want you to think about this. How would you get through this crazy world she's headed into without having lots of confidence, the ability to, to think, and get beyond so many things. I want to talk about uh, that track here in a minute. Um, see if we can go on here. Oh, by the way, she gets her degree in Geneva Medical School here at New York State. We're going to talk about that in a minute, okay? This is kind of fun. I found this on the internet. This is a plaque for Elizabeth Blackwell. You know where it's located? In Ohio. It's because, in Cincinnati, because their family moved from New York to New Jersey and ended up staying most of their family time here. But all her work that she accomplished was in New York City as far as, you know, at the end of the story. But I thought that was kind of cool. And she actually did have a stamp for her, a U.S. stamp for her back in the day. I remember, did anybody remember when stamps were 18 cents? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that dates me a little too, to make a long story short. So I, don't, I didn't put the real date on there because I made me feel older than the real <laughs> But it is the truth, okay? So let's talk about uh, why she chose medicine. Why did Elizabeth choose a bright woman? She, she had done a lot of teaching in her prior time, but this is the fun part. Um, and I don't know if I would have had the um, uh, wherewithal to kind of step it up like she did, okay? So I want to just read this one to you. Page 24 I have located here. Okay, in 1845, medicine was a strange choice for anyone who craved professional prestige, let alone a woman, okay? Quote, unquote, my favorite studies, this is Elizabeth, were history and metaphysics, she wrote. And the very thought of dwelling on the physical structure of the body and its various ailments filled me with disgust. Now, this is her first perspective of it. The book goes on to share why she got into medicine. At the age of 24, Elizabeth Blackwell was selected as, uh, had selected medicine as a means of proving a truth she believed to be divinely sanctioned. This is cool. The woman could be anything they wished according to the limits 
of their individual talent and toll and in reaching their fullest potential would raise humanity closer to its ideal. She wasn't in it for making me feel better. She was in it to say, Barb, you can do more. And that's a very different perspective than you might have thought for somebody to get into the vocation, if you will, and to fight so hard to get there, part two of that story, you know? Uh, I find that kind of kind of an interesting perspective, but maybe it fits the personality here a little bit, would you say? You know, um, she thought she was better than a lot of ladies, other ladies at any rate. All right, I want to share a little bit about her journey, because that is sort of entertaining, too, in all fairness, as a, as a book read. Um, she sends multiple letters of inquiry and interviews to the hospitals in New York and Philadelphia, because at that time, supposedly, they were the leading hospitals. Of course, she gets turned down. Nobody's going to listen. Um, people laughed at her. Um, they were outraged that she would even consider requesting. No, quote, no true lady should leave purity of domestic life to study corruptions of the body. <laughs> Another perspective, you cannot expect us to furnish you with a stick to break our head. In other words, this is male doctors saying, I'm not dealing with a competition here. Why would I do that? Why would I train you for you to be competition in the medical field was another uh, perspective. Some believe not appropriate for women to study anatomy alongside men. Um, uh, there was horror in the lecture hall with women disrupting, disrupting the learning, supposedly. One recommended she dresses a man. Well, uh, now, the, this woman would have no, no, no intention of doing such a thing, not, not who this woman was. Some, another woman might have said, okay, but I play by the rules, you know. Um, some medical male professionals were sympathetic to her desire to be a teacher, but guess what? Would they stand tall for her in, in a male counterpart world? Never. And the other group that was so against her being a medical doctor was guess who? Women. Women. Exactly yeah. right. Other women couldn't see it, didn't believe that that was appropriate for a woman to be in that field. So here's the other part too. So she, now she's turned down so many places, she actually decides she's going to apply at private schools. And the mindset, a less rigorous program. This is Elizabeth talking, okay, a less rigorous program. So this is fun. She applies to Geneva Medical School right in our backyard, kind of, right? Okay, that's William and Mar uh, William Smith, I think now is what they are. But at any rate, um, all male body. The faculty decide they're going to let the students decide whether they want a female in the uh, lecture halls with them. Now here's the fun part. Elizabeth's perspective is because they're a bunch of boys, and we know how boy and their behaviors are, it becomes a lark for them to go, yes. 113 male students from Geneva Medical School vote yes. One voted no for her to join them to get a degree. It was a lark. They thought it would be much fun. You know where I'm going at. Yeah. Pointing at her, she becomes this independent, separate thing, you know? What was interesting, of course, when the students voted yes, the faculty went crazy. They were horrified at the whole thought. Okay, they were not a happy deal. Ironically, what's really kind of fun here is when Elizabeth enters the classroom, that she gets in, okay, and she enters the classroom, the male counterpart, they actually lose their boyish mischievousness and they actually settle down from an attitude and the learning is better, which is kind of ironic, okay? Um, the college is receiving both positive and negative PR for this woman in the, in the midst. You know, some are thinking it's very progressive, some are thinking, are you kidding me? What is this woman doing here? Every once in a while she had to sit outside the lecture hall and not be in the classroom with the other students. That was part of what was going on. Um, and still at the time, other colleges were not excited about admit, admitting women because the mindset behind other colleges were it would negate the rigor of their program. Now, a medical degree at that time required two years of schooling, okay? And in the middle of it, you go off and do some assistance and kind of like, I suppose what we call internship kind of thing, either at a hospital or with another doctor, okay, that kind of deal. Or you do some self-development uh, on your own. I don't know what that meant, but that was part of the, the deal. And then you got your degree. Then you got your degree. I'm thinking, you know, it was a long break between the two two years, but still, you know, when you think about today's world. So, at any rate, um, the whole training you need to understand was not just that, because um, Elizabeth decides after she goes, she graduates, gets her degree, okay, and she goes to Europe, and she gets more training there. 
But guess what? In Europe, they're not loving women either in the environment, okay? But ironically, and I find this most interesting, because she was rubbing elbows with the right people, she was networking, and she'd get a few male counterpart types on her side, they would get her spots. But you need to understand, even in Europe, they knew she'd be going home with me. So they allowed her to learn, but then they would only allow her to learn in certain places. And I didn't know, one of the things that the author does for us is that she also shares um, the growth of the medical profession in terms of us. Did you know that the Buffalo um, uh, had a uh, medical journal that they would produce back in the day? And I didn't know that. AMA happened when American Medical Association started during this time, not, not that, you know, when she graduated from the college. So she graduates with honors because she does so well. Surprise, surprise, right, ladies? <laughs> she graduated with honors. She really, you know, did what she needed to. Um, you know, there were smirks in the classroom. She says, I have to uh, lecture. She was required to sit outside. She could not allow herself to become flushed. In other words, get embarrassed when there was talks of sex organs in the classroom because obviously when the guys would really go at it and there was enough of that going on anyways. To make a long story. So lots of self-control is what she was, what the book was talking about. Um, sometimes she got accusations from internals and externals that she was wicked or insane to be there. I mean, it's just kind of wild. Um, she spends her required non epic time at a place called, within that middle time, at Buckley's Institute. It's an almshouse. And you know what an almshouse is? It's a, it turns out to be, and I learned that through here, it's a precursor to hospitals. It's the precursor to hospitals. The poor would come for, for help, okay? And usually, the, 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 the indigents of the world, if you will, they're the people who are, um, you know, pregnant because they don't, you know, they can make a living. All those kinds of folks are there, so they're not the, the wealthy people, doctors came to you. Okay, but in, in the world, if you're poor, that's not how it worked. But my point in sharing that with you, she got lots of good training there because she saw some of the worst of life, if you will, in that environment and learned a great deal. When she gets to Europe to do the same um, tr more training, she goes off and she's there for a couple of years. What I don't get is her connections paid her way there. Her cousin Kenyon, who was up from England, ended up paying for those two years she's there. She ends up in Germany, or no, ends up in Paris, and she's uh, working in La, La Maternité or something like that. It's a hospital, okay, and it deals with just childbirth, pregnancy, childbirth. And she learns a great deal there. Uh, ironically, she also loses her eye there. She's helping deliver a baby uh, whose mother has gonorrhea and the conjunctivitis deal. She gets it in her eye. Now, they didn't put shields on, apparently, right? And she ends up losing her eye out of that deal. Crazy, huh? You know? And they gave her a glass one. As, as the story goes, she gets up with a glass one out of that deal. And most people didn't know, so it must be pretty good fit. I don't know. <laughs> At any rate, um, she survives that, and she continues on, in all fairness, okay? Then she goes to England, and she spends some time in another arms type uh, facility, Buckley, I think they call it, um, in England, and does similar training, if you will, um, there. So the woman had additional, like, two years' worth of, of, of experience, for lack of a better way to say this, when she returns to the States. Now, in the meanwhile, there's poor little Miss Emily, okay? <laughs> Now, please understand, she is not the second American uh, woman to receive a, a doctor uh, degree. Nancy Clark, which her name was, actually um, got her, she would be the second woman to get a, a degree, and got it out of Cleveland Medical School. I think that's the Cleveland of Cleveland, you know, the male, but I'm not sure on that. But anyway, Nancy Clark, um, her brothers were doctors, and so maybe that was how her in, if you will. And she didn't stay with the career. She ended up getting married and having children, which is how we all heard that story before, kind of, kind of, you know. But anyways, um, she would have been the second very bright young lady. Um, but um, Emily, Emily kind of ends up in the medical profession because her sister, in my opinion, kind of bullies her into it. Elizabeth is alone a lot. You got to keep in mind, you're by yourself, this one woman in this very male world, and she's very lonely. 
And Elizabeth decides the only one who could meet her expectations in terms of her uh, capability, abilities, and, and, and intelligence is her, this young sister, um, Emily. Emily's first interest was more in nature and botany. So she's a pretty bright girl, okay, um, and then she had a philosophical perspective of life. But um, as Elizabeth was pushing this woman to constantly come to her, be in the medical profession with her. Now she has to get a degree out of this deal as well. But so Elizabeth, because of, again, her contacts, she's back in New York City. She's, Elizabeth's trying to set up an office. We'll talk about that in a minute. But that didn't go as well as Miss Elizabeth thought it was going to. But anyways, she gets her sister to come to New York City, puts her in Bellevue Hospital, okay? Says, hey, sis, let's try this out. See how you like this thing called medicine, all right? Well, the good news is Elizabeth ends up saying, this is good stuff. I'm liking this stuff. I'm interested in this stuff. But, but guess what? Miss Elizabeth likes it for different reasons. Miss Elizabeth likes the idea that she can help people. That's a very different mission, if you will, than Elizabeth's mission. And what comes out of this is, is Emily ends up being smarter and brighter in terms of surgery. Elizabeth did not, of course, she, when she lost her eye, that kind of ended the surgery option, fairness to Elizabeth. But it turns out that this one um, of the two sisters was really, ends up being um, more true to helping people than um, Elizabeth ever thought of being, in my opinion. In my opinion, okay? It was, it's just kind of a, and, and of course, through the whole time, their relationship, and they don't, they died there, they're, both of them died there in their 80s, okay? Uh, within a few months of each other, even though she was younger. Um, and the, through their whole relationship, Elizabeth always felt superior even to, uh, to Emily, which was kind of interesting. And so for Emily, it was always kind of painful to have her sister around. <laughs> now, it doesn't say that. They speak very lovingly in these letters they write back and forth to each other based on what I read in the, in the book. But in the meanwhile, underneath this thing, okay, is this kind of weird kind of scenario. Now, her track to get to be a doctor was really almost identical to um, her sister's. To get into a school, she tried all the ladies' schools, nobody would let her in. She ends up in Chicago to get her degree. And they tell her when she's accepted, I'm not going to guarantee that you're going to graduate from here because the trustees have to bless this. Again, the rigors of the program and all this stuff. Guess what? She goes off with that middle interim thing where you have to get some experience hands on. She comes back, and they're not going to give her a degree. She ends up finding another hospital or another teaching male teaching school in order to get her degree, and that's how she ends up getting her career, her, her medical degree. It wasn't from Chicago Rush. Um, so it, it was a constant, same kind of crazies going on for her. You know, the same deal. They had to do you know dissections and bodies and all my parents. And, um, she ran into the same crazies as um, her sister did in the, in the process. But, in fairness to her, got through it, same as her sister did. Not an easy scenario, that's for sure. Um, it's kind of fun to talk about um, the Blackwells and Florence Nightingale, okay? Well, in the medical field, right? So, um, Florence is in, in the same time frame that these ladies lived, Florence lived. And, of course, she's famous for nursing. She's famous for bringing sanitation to the battlefield, so to speak, because it's all about the wounded soldiers, the Crimean War was what they talking about. Anyways, um, they decide it's important, Elizabeth, while she's in Europe, decides to meet this Florence Nightingale. And so they meet, they think they've got all this stuff in common, but gets this one. Florence thinks it's outrageous that Elizabeth is a doctor. Only men are doctors. We women are nurses. So there was a bump head almost from the beginning. And ironically, when the two sisters finally open up their own uh, hospital, that's what they did, they used Florence Nightingale as a part of the opening to be part of the, get people involved, because people hear the name Florence Nightingale, that's positive. And a female doctor, not so positive, if you will. So it was kind of an interesting uh, story for these guys. And Florence never did stand tall for women in medicine as far as the doctor part of it. Stood tall in terms of the training nurses and whatnot. Another crazy piece of this pie is um, Civil War comes. And the women, Emily and at this point, Emily.
Emily and, and uh, Elizabeth are doctors, okay? And so they're thinking they can give something. So the U.S. government, Lincoln, his group, walk up to them and they're, they're volunteering to do something, okay? Well, all they would allow them to do is to get to this one, recruit and uh, interview women for nursing jobs. <laughs> okay? What makes it even worse, okay, is that um, they would, the government, U.S. government wouldn't allow them to train the nurses. They had to be trained in male-dominated hospitals on top of it. Think about that. How crazy that is. This woman's got their doctors. They have their own hospital. Now, mostly women go to that hospital. Let's talk about that a little bit, okay, as the story goes. But at, at that point, Elizabeth says, no way. The other thing that's fun about Elizabeth is when the suffrage is kind of happening at the yeah. same time. And you're thinking, wow, this is pretty cool. You know, this, 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 you know, this would be time for Elizabeth to stand tall, particularly when she's trying to foster this mindset of the potential of women, right? Well, Elizabeth, in her inevitable smartness, if you will, she decides that women are their own worst enemies, and she's not going to stand tall and speak to it because we, we women, don't stand tall for ourselves. It's our own fault. Truth. Now, Emily doesn't get involved. She's got her hands full with her hospital, to be honest with you, okay? So she's not into that part of it. They still are all anti-slavery from a, a, a culture perspective. But I find that kind of interesting through this whole women's suffrage perspective. Elizabeth doesn't really get on board. She kind of says, <laughs> she kind of thinks she's involved. Really what's going on in my opinion. You know, it's an interest, she's an interesting character. She really is. Um, now, um, let's see, where do I want to go with this? Um, let's go to the next page. Are you right beyond that? <laughs> okay. Um, Dr. Marie Elizabeth, I don't know if I'm saying this right, so hang with me. Zekruska. She's German, by the way. Okay. And this is an interesting story because Dr. Zach, for that way to say this, okay, comes from Germany, and she was kind of like a midwife in the Berlin hospital system. She was up high because she had a male mentor who really pushed her along. Well, the mentor passes away, and she's now in a very male chauvinist environment. She decides, I'm leaving this place. I'm going to America. And she finds Dr. Elizabeth. Blackwell, apparently on the radar screen in New York City when she comes in, okay? So she visits Dr. Elizabeth Blackwell, and the doctor has just opened up her office in New York City at this point. Emily's over in Europe doing her same process that, uh, that um, Elizabeth did. And so Elizabeth's a little lonely, in all fairness. This woman comes in, and she's very, Elizabeth decides she's very skilled and very expert for pregnancy, childbirth, that kind of thing, because that's what she did. Well, she even helps this woman get a doctor's degree. She gets her in somehow at the Cleveland Hospital, okay, or the Cleveland Medical School. So the woman ends up getting a U.S. degree down the pike a little bit, okay, after, this would have been after Emily got hers. And the, they end up being, the three of them, developing this hospital for the indigent women, okay? But here's the fun part. Elizabeth and Emily are part of that process. Emily comes home from Europe after her stint. And she ends up, um, Emily's now kind of working in a hospital where it's all about obstetrics and gynecology. She learns a lot there. She does surgery in the whole nine yards. So when they all three of them get together, they've really got an arm of expertise that isn't just aware of everybody, you know, available to everybody in New York City. So it, they kind of, it made a good connection to make a long story short. But Elizabeth and Emily are not social butterflies. They're not people who are easily comforted by socializing much. But guess what? Dr. Zack is. <laughs> and she becomes the face of this new hospital. Now let's just talk how you think that went. <laughs> Especially with Elizabeth and more than didn't go well. So Miss Zack, Dr. Zack gets a call from New England, Boston says, hey, come on up here. We want you to teach up here, okay? I assume we're going to pay her more. She wasn't an owner, if you will. Or she was a little about that. But I don't even think she was a partner. She just did their work with it. So she goes there, and the two women, Elizabeth and Emily, are kind of happy about it. She's 
it's out of there, out of their pro out, you know, out, of, out of the system there for them. You know, they're, they're really jealous of her as it boils down to it because this woman had, she was the face, she, they, they were, she had a lot of PR. I get the story was is that one of Dr. Zach's patients was a writer, a female writer who, pseudonamed male, keep this in mind as a journalist, pseudonamed yeah, yeah. male, as a journalist, and so they did a lot of um, press kind of things free. And so the hospital's name got to be known much better because of that kind of scenario. So it's kind of interesting how that, that all played out. Uh, so I think that's kind of interesting. The other thing that's kind of fun to think about back at that time, when Elizabeth and um, Emily are put in this hospital, one of the other schools are opening up female-only medical schools. Female-only. Guess what Elizabeth's comment was that? What, women can't compete in the male world? <laughs> so her mindset was those hospitals were less rigorous than, you know, where she got her degree, which, who knows, you know, it's just, anyways, it, it was kind of interesting. Now, what's even more interesting, though, is down the pike, if I can stay on track, down the pike, they open up their own infirmary for what they call indigent women's and children um, hospital, okay? Um, and it's important to understand that it wasn't just Emily and Elizabeth who were part of that story, okay? Um, Elizabeth, as it turns out, they, then they decide, after they open this up, they decide that because there's other female schools, guess what? I guess we're gonna open up a female school at the college on top of it. So uh, connected to this hospital, obviously, now is a learning institution as well that they open up, okay? Which is kind of, kind of cool. Um, they, um, because the rest of the world was doing the same thing, their mindset was, I guess we better get on board. I'm surprised again. Elizabeth leaves the scene. She goes back to, to England. And poor Emily's left to run the shop. Now, Emily's kind of happy because Elizabeth is this just this foreboding, you know, cloud that's always there, kind of pushing the envelope with her. So in the long run, but it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work on the, on the flip side of it. As it turns out, Elizabeth, after she goes, uh, yeah, Elizabeth goes for the third time to England, she doesn't come back, okay? Emily stays with this hospital system, the teaching school, for 30 years. She ends up retiring at 73, and that's when the hospital went down, but guess what? At that point, in terms of years, Cornell opens up a school for both male and female, and some of the New York cities are now male and female. So what happens is they kind of pull out of this whole system. The hospital is still there. I think it's a Presbyterian something something down in New York City. Well, it has an origin <coughs> to the Blackwell Sisters, which is kind of fun and to know. But as far as the teaching school part of it, that's not part of who they are now in any, any place. Um, a really interesting read. Um, um, when, when Elizabeth first came back from England, the first time she opened up her own office, she gets nobody, no patients, nobody. Her competition, this is kind of wild, is this Dr. Retzwell, female. And what, you know what this woman is doing? She's abortions. And of course, Elizabeth's done the Hippocratic Oath, which says, you know, value of life. So she was, a, plus she was very Christian. There was a spiritual part of her. Uh, Elizabeth writes books, she goes back to England. She's thinking, she's going to stand tall for women in England. This is what? Well, guess what? The English don't accept her. They think she's American. So therefore, she's not going to be this crusader, if you will, in England like she was here in the States. But she still, that's, in her mind, is home, is where she was born. So she's staying. And then she brings up the little girl she adopted, who's now an adult woman. And the woman lives with her in England until she passes, which is kind of a wild story in of itself. Um, anyways, I've gone on my time here. Thoughts, questions, perspectives? Um, it was a fun read. Uh, a lot, I learned a lot from a medical standpoint. Those who were nurses and those days, they, yeah, I'm just curious, she, she somewhere in there has said that the first um, place you opened Yep, up, yep. How did she afford to do that? Who was backing her? Well, that, that has been my issue with that book to begin with. There's nothing to say how did she earn a living. But I think in some of those stories, if they worked there, they slept in those hospitals, those aunt's house, and so they would feed them through there, and they had a roof over their head while they were doing that training. Oh, okay. So that's how she, she ate and, and, and had a roof over her head. But as far as um, 
other income. They weren't making. And when she was in Europe, it even boggled my mind more. But she qualifies that um, her cousin Kenyon, uh, I don't know what he did, to be honest, was paying her away. And that's why she had to come back to the States because he was kind of saying, time out. Uh, and so she was back to the States because she thought she could open up her office and she'd have plenty of customers, so to speak, patients. And they just didn't come. But I would have to believe if you were a patient of, of Elizabeth Blackwell, Dr. Elizabeth Blackwell, it would be warm and cuddly. <laughs> you know, if you were a patient of Dr. Emily Blackwell, I think it would be cuddly. You know, a more caring kind of environment. Because this, this, and Elizabeth writes books when she's now retired. She's in England. She's not doing on how to bear with me. Sexual relations for for, for married couples. Oh. I'm thinking, <laughs> interesting. Yeah. yeah. And then and she's writing how to parent, particularly how to parent girls. I mean, she's very opinionated, loves herself, obviously, you know. Um, and in fairness to the author of this book, I don't think she um, dwells on this superiority thing that I think I interpreted the book as. So in fairness, that's my interpretation. But I think you'd have to be that way to do what she, she accomplished. What you think of that lady? Um, I just had a question. Her letters and all of her documents, are they held somewhere um, in a museum or are they were they kind know. of scattered? I don't know. I think they're a bit scattered okay. because she's noted in the back where she got mm -hmm. all her letters were from different places. Okay. So my suspicion is, I don't know that for sure though in all fairness. Um, I'd have to figure out. I didn't figure that out. Yes? Did they have very diverse Eulogies, as it were, how they were remembered after they were born. Um, she, the one, I think Emily got stopped for the hospital, so they gave her a lot of credit for that, because Emily was there the longest and held that place together. Because when Elizabeth left it, it was like, oh, oh, it was the hospital failing, okay? So Elizabeth brought on some expertise and really built it to what it was. Um, I can't believe Elizabeth would just go. I mean, it was eight months after they started the school, the college, and she's taken off. You know, poor Emily's thinking, am I in the right place? Am I be doing this? You know, and so it was kind of odd. But and then in, in England, she had a little cottage that she lived. She passed away there. She'd been ill for a while, the way the book reads, and she passed away there. I think there's a plaque, but not too much more. She got registered as the first English doctor in the uh, registry because she was over there. And, and she was an English citizen at that time. She doesn't get her American citizenship till while she's in. Right before she goes to Europe, okay, is a better way to put it. So she, she, you know, that was part of the process, I guess. So she wanted, but I assume she had dual citizenship because they, in the registry there, it's a big deal. And that's why she thought if she came back to England, she could make a difference with, from a pioneering for women. But they had a couple of couple of her uh, female counterparts had come to, one of them had come to the school in the States, female, and goes back to England, who's English to begin with. And she's the one who's pioneering. It's not our buddy Miss Elizabeth, you know? So it was kind of cool. Well, maybe she had titles. She was writing these, like yeah, maybe. I, but she liked to write. I think she just got into this writing yeah, lecture, essay stuff, you know? If, if the internet were going, she'd have a blog for sure, you know? Because she really had this mindset she needed to be communicating to the world, in my opinion, best practices, okay? She really thought that's what it was all about. I, I, I really believe she knew I mean, that this, these were the answers to this, this whole thing. Well, I'm sure she loved the influence of civilization. Well, but funny, you should say that. That's really an interesting comment because here she is alone most of the time. I mean, she doesn't have a peer, and that was what what Emily was all about for her. Was going to be a peer, but because Emily was a little sister, she never gave her well, equal well. status. You know, she never, even though the woman was brighter in many ways as far as the taking care of people, um, because she had more experience at the end of the day. She never gave Emily, and Emily never felt she had on a peer level. Ironically, because of what Emily accomplished, Elizabeth's legacy got bigger. Think about it. Because she's connected to these hospitals mm -hmm. and all, and the teaching school, and getting women in school. Okay, so it's ironic that that's the way it turned out. But poor little Emily doesn't get as much time on the on the internet for sure, let alone even in the book. The book is mostly about Elizabeth because she was the driver. In fairness, she was the driver to make this happen. So you, you know, from a credit standpoint, she's formidable. You know, I mean, she's a strong person. Exactly. And usually younger. 
siblings. Out loud. Oh, oh, right. But she's not out out four. Out they, may, they, not, they may be as horrible, but they find a way around it. Yeah, that's true. And what's the other thing that was interesting is this family of eight, through this, the, the book, they're always together. Yeah. And, and Elizabeth brought a couple of the sisters to live with her. At the end, Mary, uh, Emily brings a couple of her sisters to live with her, the ones who were not out in the medical field. I don't even know if they were teaching it. The book doesn't really say what they were doing. But Elizabeth brought to help take care of the new baby, she her the six-year-old. And then Emily uh, adopts this baby, and Mary, and one of the sisters, comes to help her with this baby while Emily's off working, because she still has a hospital at this point. That's normal, right? We've all been there and done that, some of us, you know? So it was kind of, that was kind of, you know, um, I thought that was interesting, but I think back in the time, families were tight like that. I think that was part of the deal, but I think five females never married in that family. And the only uh, nieces and nephews were from the three brothers, and one of the brothers passed away, so it was only two brothers that had um, children. And that's a barrier and two.